All right, let's go ahead and talk about evaluating inverse trig functions. So when you evaluate inverse trig functions, uh, you can use a calculator if the numbers aren't so nice, or if the numbers are kind of nice, uh, you can just think about the unit circle. So this is really just like evaluating regular trig functions, but going backwards. Um, so in this video, we're going to use just nice numbers where we can use the unit circle, and uh, we'll talk about evaluating inverse trig with the calculator in a separate video. So first, uh, here we're dealing with the inverse sine function in this video. Um, now, when we answer these questions, we have to think about what the range of the inverse sine function is. So here, when we do the inverse sine of 1 half, we're going to get some number. And of course, that number has to be in the range of the inverse sine function. And remember, when we introduced the inverse sine function, uh, we saw that the range was this interval from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Uh, square brackets, because it does include the endpoints, uh, the endpoints are okay. Uh, negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, they are possible values of the inverse sine function. Okay. So uh, here's how we approach questions like this if we're not using a calculator. So what we do is we ask ourselves uh, which, maybe use a different color here, which theta in the range of the inverse sine function, which theta in this interval has, has, uh, sine of theta equal to one half. Okay, so why do we ask ourselves that? Well, we ask ourselves that because if the inverse sine uh, of one half is what we're looking for, okay, then what we can do is say, okay, take the inverse sine of one half. Let's just take that and let's just call it theta. Okay, so I'm just going to take that and call it theta. Let me call it theta. Now what I'm going to do is take the sine of both sides. So if I take the sine of the left side, I'm going to get sine of inverse sine of one half equals the sine of theta. Okay. So remember that property of, uh, of sine and inverse sine, they cancel each other out like this uh, because one half is between negative one and one, so this is totally okay, we can do that. So uh, they're going to kind of undo each other, and then what we have is one half equals sine of theta. Okay, so what we're doing is we're looking for some angle theta whose sine is one half. Now there are infinitely many such angles theta, but there's only one such angle in this interval here. And remember, it has to be in this interval because that's the range of the inverse sine function. So when we evaluate this inverse sine function, we're going to get some number, some angle here, who, uh, whose sine is 1 half, and that angle is also in between uh, negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So it's really just a unit circle thing. So if you go back to the unit circle, you'll see, oh, well, sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So that's, that's it. That's the answer. That's pi over 6. That's our theta. Okay, because uh, pi over 6, it's between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So we just answer the question, which theta in this interval has sine of theta equal to 1 half? Well, the answer is theta is pi over 6. So that's the answer to our question here, part A. It's pi over 6. Okay, so inverse sine of 1 half equals pi over 6 because sine of pi over 6 is a half, and pi over 6 is inside of this interval here. Okay. So again, uh, there are infinitely many numbers, or infinitely many angles, whose sine is 1 half, but only one such angle inside this interval. Okay, okay so that's uh, part A. Now for part B, we really just approach it exactly the same way, but instead of 1 half, we're looking at 0. So we ask ourselves, which theta in this interval, same interval because it's still inverse sine, Okay, this, we're using this interval because it's inverse sine. Remember, inverse sine has this range, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So which theta in this interval has sine of theta equal to 0? Okay. Well, really, we just go back to the unit circle and we say, oh, okay, if I look at the unit circle, I see that sine of 0 equals 0. Okay, so sine of 0 is 0. So that's our theta, okay, because 0 is inside of this interval and uh, sine of 0 is 0. And again, just like before, there are infinitely many values whose sine is 0. For example, uh, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, negative pi, negative 2 pi, negative 3 pi, negative 4 pi, 128 pi, negative 1100 pi, and so on and so forth. Um, but none of those are inside of this interval. The only one inside of this interval is 0. Okay? So again, we have to be careful about that. We've got to make sure that we pay attention to the range. So that's that. Uh, how about inverse sine of negative root 3 over 2? So 
really just the same thing. We ask ourselves, which theta in this interval has sine of theta equal to negative root 3 over 2? Okay. Okay, so if we pull out a unit circle, we'll see that, uh, so what do we know? We know that sine of pi over 3 is positive root 3 over 2. Okay, but we want a negative root 3 over 2. So uh, if we look at a unit circle, we'll see that um, sine of negative pi over 3 is negative root 3 over 2. Okay. So it really is just a matter of knowing the unit circle, looking at the unit circle. Uh, and also, if you look at a unit circle, the way it's typically labeled from 0 to 2 pi, uh, what you might see is that sine, uh, sine of uh, 5 pi over 3 equals negative root 3 over 2. And that is true. And actually, 5 pi over 3 and negative pi over 3, they're coterminal angles. So uh, remember that term, coterminal. They have the same terminal side. So if we draw a quick unit circle here, okay, here is the angle uh, negative pi over 3. Okay, here's a negative pi over 3. But then also we can go, let's zoom in a little bit on that. Also, we can go all the way around the unit circle, and then this will give us positive 5 pi over 3. Okay, so they're coterminal, but we want to be careful because remember, the range of the inverse sine function is negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So uh, 5 pi over 3, and also 4 pi over 3 over here, 4 pi over 3 is right here. Um, those are not valid answers for the inverse sine function because they're outside of the range. So when you evaluate the inverse sine function, the number you get has to be in this interval. Okay? So while the sine of 5 pi over 3 is negative root 3 over 2, that is true, it's not a valid number for the range. So um, we see that it is coterminal with negative pi over 3. Okay, 5 pi over 3 and negative pi over 3, they are coterminal. So uh, negative pi over 3 is inside of this interval, and sine of negative pi over 3 is negative root 3 over 2. So that's our answer, negative pi over 3. Okay, okay so then this is uh, negative pi over 3. Okay, so we'll zoom back out a little bit. Okay, and then lastly part D, actually a little bit simpler. So part D, there's a couple different ways to think about it, and we'll talk about both ways. They're really pretty much the same, but uh, they feel a little bit different. So inverse sine of 2, so what we do is we can just do it the same way we've been doing it. We could say which theta in this interval has sine of theta equal to 2? Well, remember, what's the range of the sine function? When you evaluate the sine function, your answer has to be between negative 1 and 1, right? So negative 1 is less than or equal to sine of theta is less than or equal to 1. Uh, no matter what theta is, that's always going to be true. So in other words, there is no theta that gives you sine of theta equals 2. So then what we could say is uh, just doesn't exist. So D and E, or a does not exist, or no solution, something like that. Um, so inverse sine of 2 does not exist, there's no solution, there's just no such number that makes that true. No real number anyway. So um, that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is just look at this directly and say, okay, inverse sine of 2, well, hey, the domain of the inverse sine function, remember, uh, this is the range of the inverse sine function. Remember, in that uh, earlier video, we also talked about the domain of the inverse sine function, and the domain is negative 1 to 1, the same as the range of the sine function, okay? So the domain of the inverse sine function, same thing as the range of the sine function, it's negative 1 to 1. 2 is outside of the domain, so since it's not in the domain, you can't evaluate the function there. So right away we can just say no solution or does not exist, D and E. Okay. So that's that. So be careful about that. Um, okay. So that's uh, example one of evaluating inverse trig functions. This is all the inverse sine function, uh, the other inverse trig functions coming up in later videos.